first started talking about Texas history to my folks at the Institute for Studies of Religion, I was referred to him as someone that I needed to get to know. And uh, he came in and help, uh, helped us plan this uh, set of programs that we've been having and uh, graciously consented to be part of the, of the program. He's the uh, Lyndon G. Bowers Professor of, of American Church History at, at Baylor. Uh, I personally have benefited. One of the things he told me was that I needed to get to uh, familiar with the uh, Texas State Historical Association. Uh, I found them on the internet, uh, became a member, went to my first meeting earlier this year. A great experience. And, I, I have that uh, uh, very much indebted to Mike for putting me on to that. Uh, this final uh, uh, presentation is going to bring us home, so to speak. Uh, uh, Mike has studied Baptist history, teaches it, and uh, is going to talk about the important role that Baylor plays in Texas Baptist history take us back to a little bit of the beginnings of Baylor in the early years and up into the era of the Civil War. So, Dr. Parrish, are you there? Yes. The microphone, the podium is oh. yours. Thank you, Gordon, and thank you all for turning out tonight. Uh, those of you who know me, particularly those of you who are my students, know full well that I don't stand on formality. Um, this is not really a lecture. Um, this is more a presentation, um, an exposition, a meditation on Baylor at Independence, during the Civil War era. Slavery, Civil War, and freedom. Those words give an impression of change, radical change, and indeed progress. Progress for some but crisis and disaster for others. Southern Baptists in Texas were part of the Southern Baptist Convention, which was formed in the mid-1840s as a result of disagreements between Northern and Southern Baptists over the issue of slavery. Now, I won't go into all the details of that, but I, what I will do is to dwell upon the result in the South, which was the formation of a separate convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, almost simultaneously with the founding of Baylor University at Independence in 1845. In 18 60, on the eve of the Civil War, the total population of Texas was about 600,000, men, women, and children of multiple races and ethnicities. Anglos, of course, were dominant. Among Christian professing Anglos, Protestants that is, Baptists were behind the Methodists. As usual, when it came to developing a mission field. But Baptists would catch up and surpass Methodists in total numbers by the end of the 19th century. But out of about 600,000 people in Texas, fewer than 100,000 were affiliated 
with a particular church. There were over 500 Baptist congregations, but the vast majority of those were exceedingly small. And most did not have a dwelling place, a church building to hold services. About 30,000 Methodists total, probably about 20,000 Baptists at most. Baptist theology was relatively simple. Baptists, like most other Christians, Protestants certainly, believed in a providential God, all-powerful, benevolent, and judgmental, a God who acted in history and to the individual. Although, although evangelical, spirit-filled, Baptists promoted intellectual activity and education. An indication of their collective efforts to achieve balance and moderation in all things. Their dominant denominational structure emphasized the local, the voluntary, the cooperative, and the, and the associational. At the highest level, the convention, the Southern Baptist Convention, as well as a Baptist State Convention. They firmly held to the belief in the priesthood of all believers, all professing believers. But they also promoted and practiced lay leadership in the church. If nothing else, they were ardent and devoted to missions. Missionizing. And their targets in Texas were a small and dwindling Mexican population, Tejanos, growing numbers of Germans and other European ethnic groups, even Indian tribes. But most interestingly and most importantly, the colored brethren. In 1860, out of a total population of 600,000, about 180,000 Texans were African American. Nearly all of them slaves. And they were considered a ripe field for mission activity. Baptists were typically Southern in their patriarchal attitudes. Patriarchal attitudes contributed strongly to what was known at the time as the pro-slavery apology, the defense of slavery against attacks by abolitionists in the North. Key ingredient of the pro-slavery apology was Heronville democracy, a belief that Southerners had achieved the perfect kind of democracy, which guaranteed the equality of all white men. Proof of that equality being the degradation and the submission and enslavement of African Americans. The pro-slavery apology justified slavery on the basis of race, the notion that African Americans were hopelessly and permanently inferior to all white people. They believed that slavery was good for black people. And they justified it as well in religious terms, using the Bible, of course, but also 
the missionizing responsibility. To Christianize, and also at the same time, to civilize slaves. They also justified slavery with the belief and practice of paternalism, the notion of a Christian master looking after his slaves as members of his own family. Baptists believed very, very strongly in the separation of church and state. But then, as now, it was very, very difficult to keep church and state entirely separate. In fact, it wasn't even desirable. It was very difficult, most of all, when it came to politics, especially the politics of slavery, which led to a grave concern, a growing concern on the part of Texas Baptists that their freedoms, both their political freedoms and their religious freedoms, were under assault by abolitionists. Another aspect of Baptist theology at this time was decidedly Victorian and romantic. And that was the notion of the good death. Death was pervasive in the 19th century. It was frequent. It was unavoidable. Victorians, Protestant Victorians, that is, developed the notion of the good death and the picture you see here depicts a person, a man, on his deathbed, surrounded by loving members of his family. He dies peacefully, and the result of the good death is that he goes to heaven, and that all the members of his family who have gone before him will meet him in heaven and all those who follow will someday join their relatives. Texas was a rapidly growing and rapidly changing place between 1835 and 1860. I'll not repeat the numbers here, but you'll note that in 1860, on the bottom row, the breakdown of Anglos and slaves was roughly 420,000 to 180,000. Obviously, slavery was very, very important to Texas. Washington County, Texas, a couple of hours south of here on the Brazos River, was one of the fastest growing and increasingly one of the wealthiest counties in the entire state, indeed in the entire south. These numbers show the rapid growth of the county to a total of about 15,000 people in 1860, more than half of whom were enslaved. The production of cotton bales alone, along with multiple other agricultural products and livestock, is proof of the importance of slavery to the economy of Washington County. By 1845, Washington County had become a center of not only economic growth, political activity, but also Baptist strength. And so it was the natural place for Baptist leaders to found Baylor University. 
One of the key features of attracting Baylor University to Independence, Texas, in Washington County, was the Independence Baptist Church, the second oldest Baptist church in Texas. If you haven't been to Independence and walked into the Baptist Church there, I recommend it. It is holy ground. It is certainly historic ground. This is the church building erected in the 1870s after a fire, but it looks very, very similar to the original building, a stone structure. The new building was erected on the foundations of the original building. And the Independence Baptist Church, the IBC, included not only white members, but also black members. One of the features of missionizing, Christianizing, and civilizing slaves was to make them full-fledged members of the church. They sat on the back pews. Church balconies in later churches were constructed for the same purpose. When the pews overflowed at the back, slaves would gather around the windows outside and peer in. The purpose of instructing the slaves was deeper, more profound than simply Christianizing and civilizing. It was to indoctrinate them and gain control over their activities to make them fully loyal to their masters in every possible way. <clears throat> While at the same time accepting the paternalistic Christian treatment from their masters. Virtually all of the early leaders of Baylor University were seriously committed to and invested in the institution of slavery, including Baylor's namesake, Judge R.E.B. Baylor, who in 1860 owned 33 slaves. He was not only one of Baylor's founders, he was a trustee for a number of years, now called a regent. He was also an ordained Baptist minister. And he was the personification of moderation. Politically speaking, Judge Baylor, of all of the early leaders of Baylor University, remained, it, remained most resistant to the notion of secession and civil war. He was the exception that proved the rule. Richard Elam, an expert on early Texas Baptists said, a positive relationship can be established between wealth, including slaves, and leadership within the Texas Baptist denomination, especially at Baylor University. This is a rather fanciful, but fairly accurate, uh, rendering of the Mail Campus on Windmill Hill at Old Baylor. And this is the female campus. The campus which is reflected in the remnant of the, of, and the rebuilding of the columns that are present at Independence today. First president of Baylor University was Henry, Henry Lee Graves, who also served as the Independence Baptist Church pastor during the late 1840s and early 1850s. He was a slaveholder, although he owned only a few slaves. He was succeeded by Rufus Burleson, president, pastor, and also the owner of probably only one or two slaves. 
Well, I won't belabor the point of the concentration of slaves county by county throughout the South during 1860, including Texas. This is a picture of Texas by county. Washington County is here. And the shading indicates population of slaves over 50% of the population. The vote on secession was a direct correlation between the numbers and the percentages of slaveholding, county by county. That is the public popular vote by county on secession. Those counties with the fewest slaves tended very, very strongly to vote against secession. Whether you were a slaveholder or not, in a heavy slaveholding county, you tended to support secession. For economic reasons, but also for reasons of security and social stability. All right? Christian slaveholders were not supposed to inflict harm, that is, punishment, on their slaves, but sometimes they were forced to do so. Of all of the abuses of slavery, the cruelties, the humiliations, the indignities, the threats, the terror, the worst aspect by far, by all accounts, was the breaking up of slave families. This was a cardinal, cardinal sin in the minds of paternalistic slaveholders. On the Seward Plantation at Independence, Texas, very near the town today, uh, it's on the National Register, open for tours. The descendants of the Seward family will give you a tour, welcome you into their home, tell you all about their ancestors. They're wonderful people. Is a slave block. A round stone just outside the side gate near the driveway. Slave auctions were held in a variety of ways, on the city streets, in towns large and small, but also on plantations. The slave block is there today as a reminder. This is a descendant of the Seward slaves. In recent years, the descendants of Seward slaves have formed a family association and have developed a relationship with the descendants of the Seward family. Now they are one family and they will tell you so. But here we see a descendant of, a, of the Seward slaves recreating a slave sale. Slaves practiced their own brand of Christianity when they were away from white people. They often met secretly, although this picture shows white people present. That was the preferred way. That was the way white people preferred that slave preachers deliver a message to their congregation, to their fellow slaves, but in secret, they espoused a liberation theology. Instead of reading passages from the Bible, such as slaves obey your masters, they told the story of the children of Israel and deliverance out of bondage. And they talked about the day of Jubilee, the day when they would receive 
their freedom, and they expected it to come very soon. Baylor leaders, including George Washington Baines, the grandfather of Lyndon Baines Johnson, worried increasingly during the 1850s about the security of slavery. He served as interim president of Baylor during the Civil War. He had two sons who served in Hood's Texas Brigade, one of whom died. William Carey Crane began his service as Baylor president late in the Civil War. Interestingly, he refused to become a slaveholder. But both Baines and Crane were vociferous defenders of the institution of slavery. Baylor included very, very generous lay benefactors. Baylor was founded to develop a pious laity and a holy ministry. One of those pious laymen was Albert C. Horton, a hero of the Texas Revolution, a survivor of the Goliad Massacre and for a time, governor of Texas, devoted Baptist, and par excellence in the practice of paternalism. Rufus Burleson was quoted as saying, nothing ever impressed me more than Horton's tender and deep interest for the comfort and religious welfare of his slaves. He owned nearly 300 a large number of them members of the Baptist Church. He made a church house for them. He employed a preacher to preach to them. If the South had been full of such Christian masters as Governor Horton, God never would have allowed the abolition fanatics to set the slaves free till they were Christianized and prepared for citizenship or to return home to Africa and colonize and Christianize the dark continent. The African race would thereby have been a blessing to both con continents. But alas, the cruel civil war crushed Horton's great heart, wrecked his princely fortune, and turned his once happy and contented slaves loose to become homeless vagabonds and made the richest part of Texas little else than an African territory. These are the words of the man whose statue graces Burleson Quadrangle. And you won't see these words on the historical marker next to the statue. I'm sorry. It's not good for the Chamber of Commerce, much less Baylor. <laughs> He was the sixth wealthiest slaveholder in Texas at the time. Baylor has always needed money. It needed money to be founded. It needed money to survive. It needs money now. Thank you. <laughs> in late 1860, Baylor had been operating for less than 15 years and on the eve of the Civil War had nearly 500 students, about 280 males and 200 women, and boasted an excellent faculty and curriculum, enjoyed a reputation throughout Texas and the South as a leading institution. Baylor leaders, including law professors who also served on the Texas State Supreme Court from time to time, were extremely alarmed about the impending election of Abraham Lincoln. Royal T. Wheeler, head of the Baylor Law Department, said, what is this but an open declaration of war upon the institution of slavery in the states? Does Lincoln's Republican Party not aim a blow at the very existence of our society? 
no less than our domestic peace and security. Wheeler was a passionate advocate for Texas to join the Confederacy and fight for Southern independence in the wake of Lincoln's election. Baylor President Rufus Burleson at first disagreed very strongly with Wheeler. His attitude reflected a unionist sentiment at Baylor among some faculty and certainly among some students, particularly the male students. It was the female students who wanted to go to war. Even after Lincoln's election, Burleson sided with his friend and fellow Baptist Governor Sam Houston in opposing secession and remaining loyal to the Union. However, like the vast majority of Unionists in Texas and across the South, Burleson became a patriotic Confederate when Texas joined the other six states of the Deep South by seceding in early 1861 and after the firing on Fort Sumter and Lincoln's calling of troops, that tide became overwhelming. These are times of profound excitement. Baptist and lawyer and judge Nicholas Battle wrote to Judge Baylor, the election of Lincoln has roused the people. I desire to see Texas secede. We should listen to no terms of accommodation from the puerile, I love that word, puerile, faithless North. They are treacherous, too deeply imbued with infidelity. These are religious terms, infidelity, socialism, accusations of foreign behavior, socialism, and the most horrid of all isms, abolitionism the sum of all villainies. For any further association with Southern gentlemen, patriots, and Christians, I look upon the abolitionists as our worst enemies on earth. Another Baylor benefactor who owned at least 200 slaves in 1860 was Asa Hoxie. His plantations were situated near Independence Although he was not a Baptist, he was a major supporter of Baylor during this period. He recognized that what was good for independence in Washington County was good for Baylor and vice versa. Of course, John Brown's raid in 1859 was a crucial turning point in whipping up fear in the South about slave insurrection the Texas Troubles in the summer of 1860 only made matters worse, a widespread panic of, about a slave uprising. George Washington Baines, editor of the Texas Baptist newspaper at the time, justified vigilante activity, rounding up alleged slaves who were rebelling and abolitionists and hanging them. He said, we are hanging them to save our own lives. I'm sorry, folks. This is what he wrote. And of course, the fear was Abraham Lincoln, the so-called black Republican, whom Southerners generally considered to be an abolitionist. He wasn't really. He said he wasn't. Southerners didn't believe him. Judge Royal T. Wheeler was an outspoken advocate of secession, as I mentioned. Sam Houston warned Texans that rivers of blood will flow. We cannot win this war. An entire generation of young Southern males will be wiped out publicly. He stated, my God, is it possible that all the people have gone mad? The voice of the people is not always the voice of God. For when demagogues and selfish political leaders succeed in arousing public prejudice and stilling the voice of reason, then on every hand can be heard the popular cry of crucify him, crucify him. 
the voice of the people then becomes the voice of the devil. Sam Houston had been baptized by Rupus Burleson in 1854. Thanks to the relentless entreaties of his wife, Margaret Lee Houston, whom he had married in 1840, he finally joined the Baptist Church and was baptized in 1854. When Rufus Burleson baptized him, the story goes, he said, General, now all your sins are washed away. Houston said, have mercy, may God have mercy on the fish downstream. <laughs> Margaret Lee Houston succeeded in finally forcing Houston to settle down, in particular to stop drinking. Margaret Lee Houston's favorite first cousin was William P. Rogers. Originally from Mississippi, he settled in Texas in 1851 and became a lawyer, a very successful lawyer. He was a devoted Baptist, and for a time he was a law professor at Baylor University at Independence. Sam and Margaret Lee Houston named one of their sons after William Rogers. William Rogers Houston. But William P. Rogers and Sam Houston had a disagreement about politics, the politics of slavery. And when the war began, practically all of the male students at the behest of Rufus Burleson the male students who had moved to Waco University with Rufus Burleson when he had a feud with Horace Clark, principal of the female department at Independence, virtually all of them volunteered for service. One was George Scott, who here, here carries a sword and a Bible before going to war. His sister wrote in 1862, I feel sad and anxious every day to see the companies of men going to war. When our company left, we came out to bid them goodbye. You never saw such a time of weeping. I pray every day that these whom I love, whose lives are precious to me, may be Christians and thus ready for either life or death. All Christians should pray to the ruler of nations to be on our side and speedily return peace. Both sides, North and South, during the Civil War were firmly convinced by and large that God was on their side and that they were fighting a holy war. She also wrote, I want us women to all to learn to use a gun and a pistol well, so that we can be ready if danger comes near home. God bless you all. William P. Rogers became colonel and commander of the 2nd Texas Infantry in 1862. He fought at Shiloh with great distinction. In October of 1862 at the Battle of Corinth, he was mortally wounded. This is a depiction of him going over the ramparts of Battery Robinette, an earthen fortification on the outskirts of Corinth. He's carrying the regimental battle flag. And there he was shot down. The idea of the good death in the Civil War was much like the idea of the good death in peace, a deathbed scene. The wounded, mortally wounded person, in this case, an officer, receiving the attention of nurses and an attending physician 
a letter being written to the family members back home assuring them that he had died a good death, that he had professed his faith and was ready to die and to go to heaven. This is the picture of Colonel Rogers in death on the field at Corinth. It's one of the grisliest photographs of the Civil War. He is here on the left, bearded. His uniform ripped open, his boots removed by Union troops who had looted the battlefield, his eyes open, staring upward to heaven. Hardly a good death. This is a photograph taken by a photographer from Illinois who had come to Corinth to make pictures of Union soldiers who were part of the occupying force at Corinth. And he took his camera out to the battlefield the day after and assembled the bodies of about a dozen Confederates, including Rogers, propped him up to make him as prominent as possible, and took the picture. You can see several boys here in the background gawking, making the scene all the more ludicrous and irreverent. This is the epitome of a bad death, certainly not a good one. And yet, it became, over time, in fact, very quickly, a good death. Because a Union officer took pity on Rogers, his corpse, that is, dragged it over to a shade tree, covered it with a blanket, and summoned the Union command commander, William Rosecrans, to come over and examine the body. Rosecrans took one look at Rogers and said, he is one of the bravest men who ever led a charge. Bury him with full military honors so that his family can come, locate his body, claim him, and take him home. But his body remained at Corinth. He was buried where he fell, according to his family's wishes. And he became a martyr to the lost cause. A devotion and a reverence and a worship for the Confederacy and its legacy. This is a picture fashioned by a woman in Mississippi of Colonel Rogers's picture. It is an homage, a collage, celebrating the lost cause. It's today in the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. You can see the Confederate regalia, the Confederate flag, the lettering, Colonel Rogers, and other Gallup Confederates killed in, in front of Robinette, October 1862. And the names of other battles emblazoned along the left. In the early 20th century, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, who had been taking care of the grave up to now and pointing it out to travelers and tourists who came through Corinth, raised money for a very expensive and handsome marble obelisk and gravestone. Descendants of William P. Rogers gathered there to dedicate the grave. One of his grandsons held aloft the sword that he had carried at Corinth. When Sam Houston heard of Rogers' death, he wept. He wept for Rogers, he wept for the South. 
because by 1863, the South was beginning to lose the Civil War. This is the last photograph of Sam Houston taken, just recently discovered, by the way. Quite a contrast to the vigorous man of just a few years earlier that we saw. Other Baylor students served in the Civil War, former students, that is, General Lawrence Sullivan's Sol Ross, Jerome B. Robertson, a commander of Hood's Texas Brigade, lived at Independence, supported Baylor. His son, Felix Robertson, was a Baylor student. He also became a Confederate general. Hood's Brigade was known to Robert E. Lee as my Texans. He said, my Texans never fail, they never waver. Henry McArdle, a renowned Texas artist who for a time was an art teacher at Baylor at Independence, helped to sustain and increase the <coughs> visibility of the lost cause in Texas by fashioning multiple large paintings of Confederate heroes, including Robert E. Lee in the wilderness with Hood's Brigade, Captain Tacitus T. Clay married Betty Seward of the Seward family. He was a captain in Hood's brigade. He had been mayor of Independence immediately before the Civil War, and when the boys who, the, Bo the Baylor boys who supported the Union raised an American flag, he went over and cut the flagpole down. He was wounded multiple times during the Civil War, lost a leg, came home, never recovered, and within a few years was dead. But not before he helped to put an end to Reconstruction in Washington County. Freedom. Freedom. Texas Baptists, that is Anglo-Texas Baptists, feel like they had lost most, if not all, of their freedom as a result of defeat in the Civil War. During Reconstruction, they fought politically and violently to recapture, reclaim, to restore that freedom. But in the meantime, black Baptists in Washington County, in Independence, and indeed all over the South, claimed freedom for themselves. The Baptists, the black Baptists of Independence Baptist Church broke away by 1871 from the white congregation and formed their own, the Liberty Baptist Church which flourishes to this day, just a few hundred yards away from the Independence Baptist Church. Matthew Gaines, a black Baptist preacher, was well known to the congregation of the Liberty Baptist Church. During the Civil War, he was a runaway slave from Washington County. He was recaptured, re-enslaved. During Reconstruction, he used his skill as an orator to become a politician and was elected to the, United, to the Texas State Senate, one of two African Americans elected to the Texas State Senate during Reconstruction. This is an early picture of Matthew Gaines looks very much like a very rough freedman. <coughs> this is Matthew Gaines just a couple of years later serving <coughs> in the Texas State Senate. He spoke out against the violence. He spoke out against sharecropping. He spoke out against 
the convict leasing system which targeted young black males. In the penitentiary system to perform free labor on sugar plantations and, and railroads in order to offset the Texas state budget. And this was an institution that was very common throughout the South. He spoke out against the threat of segregation in public facilities, in public schools especially. But segregation won out because Reconstruction was overthrown. Segregation was most evident in religion. Separate churches, black and white. Indeed, separate cemeteries, black and white. This is a historical marker at the Liberty Community Cemetery near Independence. The Independence Cemetery, the White Cemetery, is much more visible, much easier to find. <coughs> so Texas Baptists, white and black, then, in the wake of Reconstruction, and now remain largely separated. Christian slavery and paternalism tried, ironically, to bring Baptists together. But the Civil War and Reconstruction tore them apart. Baylor University and uh, Waco University managed to survive the Civil War. Baylor eventually merged with Waco University in 1886 with Rufus Burleson as president. And here it remains in Waco. I'll stop right there and thank you for your attention and be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Well, again, I'll, I'll get us started. Uh, I, I think very, very early on, you were dealing with the stats on uh, church members and residents, et cetera. Yeah. The implication of that seems to me is that at the time that you're talking about, the great majority of Texans are not connected religiously with anything and that our picture of, of uh, American history is one in which uh, a cr yeah. basically Christian country is losing out. So that, yeah. Uh, is, seems to be the other way around. Is that correct? Well, uh, in, in Texas, anyway, that was certainly the case. Um, fewer than 20%, possibly as few as 12% of Texans at the time were affiliated with a church of any kind, including uh, recent German immigrants. The great majority of them were unchurched, surprisingly. You would think, well, they would be Catholic or Lutheran or, or something, but no, indeed they were not. Texas was considered um, a mission field. Um, you know, the choice was given to some missionaries. Do you want to go to China or do you want to go to Texas? Um, it was ripe for the harvest. I have a, a cousin who's a... Baptist missionary in Alaska. The parallels are very similar. Uh, Alaska is a very, very rough place. It's a frontier. Uh, most people have no affiliation and indeed no interest in religion of any kind. 
in Alaska. In Alaska. Um, he, he describes Alaska affectionately as a land of misfits and criminals, a place to escape. And so in the 1830s and 1840s, Texas was much the same way. Yeah. Now at dinner, I'll just say something while you all are coming up with interesting questions. At dinner I mentioned that I teach Texas history and I don't teach it in the usual way, as some of my students know. I uh, like to attack, um, well, examine, explore various myths and legends, stereotypes, and heroes of Texas and paint uh, as complicated and challenging a picture of Texas history as I possibly can. I portray Texas history, Texas as a, as a place then and now of great contrast, great variety, and great conflict. If we don't see it immediately in front of us, it's not very far. Questions? Anybody? Yes? Whoever raised his hand first. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Parrish. I, um, I had a question about Baptist and separation of church and state. Yeah. Uh, early in your, your talk, you mentioned uh, Texas Baptist yeah well you know typically when we think of separation of church and state we we think of keeping the state out of church affairs and teaching the keeping the church out of state affairs um, and in those days that meant that clergymen could not serve in the legislature, okay? That's not true anymore. But state, in terms of government, very often becomes government policy, doesn't it? And government policy needs politics to operate, to be formulated, okay? So where church and state begin to come in contact with one another is in the realm of religious beliefs and politics, okay? The human dimension of church and state. Uh, in an ideal sense, church and state should be kept separate so the one can critique the other, all right? Hold the other in balance, right? In harmony. But it's not always a harmonious situation, is it? It's impossible to completely separate church and state and not really even desirable. The two have to be held in tension with one another. Okay? Good question. I have yeah. a question about Reconstruction. Uh -huh. um, it was striking to see before the war the, the difference in county and, and some kind of like, Can you speak up just a little bit? Sure. I'm, I'm uh, fighting a cold and I, I can't hear. Uh, I'm wondering if, if the federal government treated counties that had a lot of slaves differently than counties that did not have a lot of slaves. Now what do you mean by treat? During Reconstruction. Oh, they, you're, they, they, you're, you're talking about uh, freedmen, not slaves. Well, before the war, there were some counties that had many slaves. Yeah. And after the war, um, and I'm wondering if the federal government treated those areas differently during Reconstruction than other areas that did not have a lot of slaves in Texas. Well, not necessarily. And, and, I, and why do you ask the question? 
let me let me let me get some clarification. Well, I mean, that's a fairly open-ended question. Why yeah. why do you ask it? There was such a difference in the secession vote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if the federal government would treat those who were anti-secession differently. Yeah. After the war. Yeah. Well, those. Okay. All right. I understand what you're asking now. Yes. Uh, the federal government. Uh, union authorities and union troops, although there never were that many union troops, treated areas that had opposed secession as areas of uh, loyalism. They looked upon those who had resisted secession, and particularly those who had uh, resisted Confederate authority as uh, loyalists who were good candidates to become members of the Republican Party. And indeed, many of those loyalists uh, during Reconstruction did become members of the Republican Party as so-called scalawags, the epithet given them by former Confederates. And so, uh, the federal presence in, in those counties, low slave, late, low slave holding counties, counties of loyalty, federal pres presence was, was minimal. Yeah. Would the Hill Country be part of those? Yes, yes indeed. North Texas and the Hill Country were the strongest areas of resistance to secession, uh, resistance to Confederate authority, uh, during the Civil War, there was uh, violence in those areas. Uh, Confederate troops inflicted violence upon Unionists in North Texas. Um, the Great Hanging at Gainesville is one dramatic example of the persecution and violence of uh, disloyal elements. Um, in the Hill Country, Germans especially uh, were resistant to secession. Uh, not all Germans, about h half of the Germans, or less than half, were resistant. And by that I mean vociferously, um, stubbornly resistant to secession and resisted Confederate authority. And there was, there was uh, violence against them uh, during the Civil War. Texas is a violent place, <laughs> have you noticed? <laughs> Does that answer your question? Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was curious about the uh, Native Americans during yeah. the Civil War and the uh, kind of how much were the uh, Baylor founders uh, thinking about that during the Civil War? Okay. Well, <laughs> how much were they thinking about? Uh, Uh, well, I tell you what, during the Civil War, uh, independence was far enough removed from the frontier that uh, there wasn't a lot of concern about um, uh, Indians. It, it was out on the frontier, uh, you know, west of, of Waco, uh, that um, Indians were most troublesome. Um, uh, in fact, they, you know, the Comanches especially became more aggressive during the Civil War. And uh, Anglo manpower had been depleted. Um, most uh, white men went into the Confederate Army, and so local militia groups, uh, very often consisting of men in their 40s and 50s, had to be organized. Um, what worried uh, people in Washington County was uh, a, a slave uprising. Uh, because so many white men had gone off and joined the Confederate Army, um, the white population of Washington County and in other high slaveholding counties were very worried about um, an uprising by uh, the slaves. They appealed to uh, the Texas government to send men back from the army who had been members of the slave patrols before the war. Because they were worried about unrest among the slaves. Yeah. Excellent question. 
Yes, sir. One more. Mr. Robinson. Well, I guess I'm going to ask a question. Oh, sure. Um, you mentioned the Matthew Gaines. Yes. One of the African Americans represent. Who, <coughs> who was the other one? The other one was another great question. Uh, George T. Ruby, who was a black mulatto carpetbagger from New England. He was uh, uh, a carpetbagger who came south during the war, uh, during wartime reconstruction in Louisiana, uh, where he was one of the major founders of Loyal Union League chapters. The Loyal Union League was a local grassroots political organization that was biracial. It included whites and freedmen um, to help organize and support re the Republican, Republican Party activity across the South uh, during Reconstruction. And he was so successful in uh, founding Loyal Union League chapters across uh, Louisiana and Texas that he became very popular and was elected to uh, the uh, Texas State Senate during Radical Reconstruction. During Radical Reconstruction, for only a few years, as a result of federal, uh, the federal militarization of uh, the occupied South, African Americans had the right to vote in prolific numbers. And they turned out, almost a, it was almost 100% uh, voter turnout. They were the backbone of the Republican Party in the South. And as time went on, they became aware that they were not achieving leadership roles, uh, the leadership roles that they deserved. Matthew Gaines and George T. Ruby were exceptions to the general rule of leadership by white Republicans, uh, carpetbaggers and scalawags. And African Americans, uh, 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 black Republicans, began to refer to themselves as the field hands of the Republican Party. One of the ironies of Reconstruction, but no surprise considering the strong element of race and racism even among white Republicans. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the hour is upon us. Uh, I appreciate your...